Bleacher Report just released a 2023 NHL redraft, and you know what time it is, folks. We have to go and review it. So how does Bleacher Report see the 2023 draft just a year removed from it? I've heard this list is a little bit nuts, so we're going to be dissecting every part of it. So make sure you watch till the end for all that, and hit that subscribe button if you're new for more hockey content just like this all throughout the year. And here it is, redrafting the top 10 picks of the 2023 NHL draft. And people have said to me when I've even done redrafts of like 2021 that I've been doing it way too early. Well, we got a redraft here for 2023. I don't see it as much of a problem to do redrafts at any point. I mean, throughout any draft year, I'm consistently, constantly changing my draft rankings. So a year ahead of time to change them, I don't have too much of a problem with that. At the start of the article, they go through the whole situation and say the year isn't a lot of time in the totality of a hockey career. But at this stage of development, it's nothing to sneeze at either we now have a better picture of who a lot of these guys could be as nhlers now starting at number one of course it is no surprise to see Connor bedard at this spot he went first overall he was the consensus first overall pick and with his great calder campaign offensively there are so many reasons why he is still undoubtedly the best player from that draft it's still surprising to me just how good Bedard was able to do in his rookie year, considering the situation, how young he was as a July birthday, but also the team around him, the injuries. There was a lot going against Bedard in his rookie season, but he was still able to put up 22 goals, 61 points in 68 games. Defensively, obviously, there were major issues there, but he was 18. <laughs> it was very easily explainable, and also his team didn't really help out much there either. He will get better, and this sophomore season is just going to be even better for him, hopefully a lot more healthy too. Now, first overall was never in doubt, but going to second place, they have Matt Michkov getting selected by the Anaheim Ducks. Now, they're going to say how Michkov's offensive skill is significant enough that it warrants this high of a rise, jumping from seventh to second, but I don't think the offense was ever a question with Michkov. For a lot of teams, he either didn't want to play there or they didn't really have much confidence that he would end up signing. It seemed like it was the perfect situation for Philly to end up getting him, for him to sign there because it seemed like he really wanted to be a Flyer. but I think there were questions for a lot of teams if you'd actually sign and Anaheim might have been one of those teams now this could be one of those redrafts that doesn't really factor in the teams and just goes by the prospects and in that case having each got second overall I don't really mind it I mean I would probably still prefer a fan Tilly maybe Leo Carlson because of I think the center value that they can provide but still I wouldn't blame anybody for putting each at number two but if this actually were to have happened and they selected each instead of Carlson I think that would have changed a lot about Anaheim especially their center situation because they wouldn't have Carlson they would just be McTavish and Zegras there and I definitely don't think they would have been the team to go after Cutter Gauthier because I think he kind of filled that Matt Vimichkov hole that Anaheim might have had on the wings I think they would have prioritized the center position for sure and it would have left them not in a bad place but certainly a lot worse off than they are right now so in Anaheim's case I still think even with the situation even if Michkov were to come over I think with how well Carlson showed in his rookie season they might have still taken it. Now we move on here to number three and at third overall, they have Will Smith getting selected by the Columbus Blue Jackets. Now this was something that was a little bit of a rumor back around the draft that Columbus was enticed. They were really interested in Will Smith. Obviously that didn't end up happening. I think that was mostly because Adam Fantilli ended up dropping and they just couldn't say no. But interestingly, they go after Smith here. The reasoning apparently is Will Smith's hockey sense and playmaking abilities make bumping him up from fourth to third feel like a no-brainer. It's something that would have even made sense about the benefit of hindsight, which is zero slight to Adam Fantilli, who previously occupied this spot. They go on to say, don't be fooled into thinking he's a one-zone wonder, though. Smith is just as often caught working hard on his own end, anticipating where opponents are or will be, and shutting down lanes with his stick and back-checking. I don't know if I quite agree with this. I mean, I don't think that defensively he's the worst player in the world, but I think he also benefited from the NCAA's inconsistencies as a league. I think once he goes against pro competition against men, his physicality is going to take a bump down, I would say, and those defensive reads are going to be a lot harder to come by. In Smith's case, again, I don't think he's going to be the worst defensive player in the league, but I think there will be some major growing pains there that might have been overlooked here. This whole argument, though, is just very strange to me because I think when you compare both these players developmentally Fantilli is just way ahead of the curve you look at what Fantilli was able to do in his draft year in the NCAA 65 points in 36 games which is just unheard of then you got Will Smith who after his draft year which sure it is still his rookie season but after his draft year got 71 points in 41 games so you have a point per game difference that goes for Fantilli here and that was in his draft year and then you have Fantilli already coming up to the NHL level and putting up some 
some decent offensive numbers there. If Will Smith were to do the same, I think he would have gotten caved in. I think there was, is a clear difference between these two players. And yes, I think the actual age of these players is a pretty big difference. You got an October birth date compared to a March birth date, but... I feel like saying that Will Smith's dominance in the NCAA puts him ahead of Fantilli is just a strange argument to me. Especially when you consider the fact that Fantilli, if he were to have played in the NCAA this last year, I think could have gotten 70 plus points if healthy, maybe 80 points if he played the full season. It would have been absolutely insane. Let me know down below, would you take Smith over Fantilli right now? I don't think I would, but I respect the boldness. And then of course we have a number four, Adam Fantilli, who now gets taken by the San Jose Sharks. I mean, I think the Sharks would take that quite a bit imagine having Celebrini and Fantilli to me that's even more dangerous than Celebrini and Smith especially in Fantilli's case who I think could be a lot more of a natural second line center and wouldn't have to just rely on his offense to provide value especially with Fantilli's fan, uh, physicality there but at number four to me this is just insane as they say he only gets bumped down a slot because Smith's skill is just that slight hair higher to me if Smith's skill is only a slight bit higher than Fantilli I don't know why you'd rank Smith higher because I agree that Smith's ceiling skill wise is higher than Fantilli's, but I think in a lot of other directions with the overall game, Fantilli beats Smith physically in, in terms of development, in terms of actual defensive play at their peaks. I think Fantilli beats them in terms of long term value and even value right now. I think, again, if you put Smith in the same position, you'd see a lot more struggling than Fantilli showed, and I will stand by that. But, folks, I just realized what this means. <laughs> I just realized what this means not only is will smith above adam fantilli he's also gonna be above leo carlson and i might as well scroll down and there it is leo carlson fifth overall by the montreal canadians i don't know what's going on here i mean let's be clear fifth overall by montreal would be insane imagine if they also selected demidov this year too you'd have caulfield suzuki carlson ivan demidov kirby doc oh man that would be so much fun but obviously did not end up happening. They talk about Leo Carlson being fit in this redraft says nothing negative about him. Rather, it says only positive things about the players ahead of him, talking about the workload, how he didn't play all 82 games, and talking about the playmaking, the awareness, and everything like that. I get it. I mean, I agree with the assessment of his play style here, but everything else just makes no sense to me. What did Leo Carlson do last year to warrant dropping three spots in the draft ranking? I just don't understand that. I mentioned this a lot of times during the 2023 draft process that Meech got being ranked fourth for me behind Fantilli, behind Carlson was not because of the Russian factor. I personally didn't care about that, especially when it comes to player rankings. I knew that Michkov was going to come over eventually and be a stud offensively. That was no question. But back then, my concerns were about the overall game, the defensive play. And especially in players like Leo Carlson specifically, you saw massive strides throughout the year in his two-way game, in the awareness around the ice, the complimentary play with his teammates and how he was working off them. The vision that he processed was just unbelievable. And those were traits that I valued over the more one-dimensional play of a player like Michkov. That was a reason why, you know, even today I would have the same ranking. It doesn't change anything that Michkov's coming over first. I mean, Michkov might put up the most points out of this, out of those three, but in players like Carlson's case, the value is all over the ice. And my main concerns were that we weren't going to see that explosiveness offensively immediately, but I think we did see that, especially when Anaheim was using him in a lot of correct ways here, playing him in 55 games, getting 12 goals, 17 assists for 29 points. Sure, I think his role was extremely sheltered. They put him in the best position possible to succeed, but I think Carlson is in a position where he'll benefit from that and get better and better at the NHL level. And considering he's a natural centerman, considering how well he's adjusted that center position already, to me, the value there is just off the charts to be in this placement. Fifth overall is insane to me. It's the exact same weird situation to be with Fantilli versus Smith, where Leo Carlson has already come and proven himself offensively at the NHL level a year before Will Smith is going to, and is already going to have that runway, already has that progression, already has the reputation there as an NHL player. So what has Will Smith done to prove that he's above these two guys? Uh, to prove that he's above these two centers that have already transitioned well to the NHL. It just doesn't, I, I, I don't understand it. Unless you are like, oh, Will Smith is my second best prospect back in 2023 and you're trying to stick by your guns. 
I just don't understand why you'd have this rank. But again, I go back to the argument. If Leo Carlson, if Adam Fantilli were in the NCAA this year, would Will Smith be getting the buzz that he's getting in this article? I don't think so. I mean, you obviously see the skill that Will Smith has, but I think if you saw these two guys in the NCAA last year, you would have seen absolutely monstrous seasons, way more than what Will Smith put up on, especially a BC team that was stacked around him too. That's something that I don't think a lot of people are talking about either. I just feel like the ranking here is recency bias in a strange way and I just don't jive with it at all. We got to keep going here and at sixth overall they end up having Ryan Leonard originally selected eighth overall by Washington. I can see where this one's coming from. You guys know I've liked Ryan Leonard for a long time now. I originally ranked him seventh overall in my rankings in 2023 which I think is looking pretty good right now but in Leonard's case he's still behind Smith, Zach Benson and of course Fantilli, Carlson, Michkov and Bedard for me but still the dog in him for what he was able to show at BC this year for how valuable he was was in the possession game and the physical play it's hard to have him outside the top eight the top 10 it's looking like a great pick for the caps this is a weird thing for me is that now that this article had mentioned montreal as a great fit for carlson i guess they're taking into account the teams here which just makes it even weirder to me because you mentioned arizona how they initially chose simashev at sixth overall ryan leonard is a much better option for this spot as his lethal goal scoring and high energy player things every organization can benefit from but from what i can tell Sim utah arizona they love simashev they absolutely adore the physical play, the heights, the size there, and I think they should. He's a fantastic defensive defenseman. And especially considering they would get Teach Aginla, who I think is a pretty similar player to Leonard in a lot of ways, in the next draft. I don't think that they would go for Leonard here. Maybe they instead would go for Leonard and maybe a Salayev in the la in the next draft. But honestly, I'd rather have Simishev and Aginla over Leonard and 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 Salayev. Maybe that's just me, but that's how I see it. And at number seven, there is my boy Zach Benson finally getting taken by the Philadelphia Flyers this time. I don't think he's better than Matthew Beachkov, but Benson is a pretty good consolation prize. Us Benson enjoyers know how good he was last year, how he already was transitioning onto the NHL level. 30 points in 71 games. I think for a player that young, for his size, is impressive. But if you've been watching him, you know the dog in him. You know the relentless play that he has. You know the skill that he has in tight. And those things I saw translating to the NHL pretty quickly. Not as quickly as they did, but still, it wasn't a huge surprise that Benson was already an effective NHLer. At least for the people that actually were watching him, 13th overall was a steal and will continue to be. And I will say, I wouldn't rank him 7th overall but if they are taking teams into account then sure i can understand at this spot i don't think a team like utah considering their size requirements would take a player like benson so i think seven is a fair spot now we keep going here at a number eight they have gabe perot being taken by the washington capitals a big jump and honestly i can absolutely see why you have leonard going of course raising a bit to utah now you have perot raising a ton from 23 to 8 but i can absolutely see why you'd have perot inside the top 10 he was somebody i ranked 14th overall back in 2023 and dropped way too much the new york rangers are getting a steal here in perot even though there is still some concerns over the acceleration speed especially when it's open ice when it's five on five you can't deny the chemistry that he automatically has with every line mate that he has you can't deny the vision the playmaking the spark plug offense that he provides and for bc he was able to show that so consistently last year also the world juniors was so effective for the u.s as well i mean i still think Pro is a little bit of ways away from being an effective nhler i think at least one more year in the NCAA will do him very good but once he's there he'll be the perfect complimentary piece now going on to number nine here interestingly for the Detroit Red Wings they have them selecting Dalibor Dvorsky now in real life I wouldn't doubt that the Red Wings would go in this direction originally back around the 2023 draft I saw Dvorsky as a pretty real option for Detroit didn't end up happening but I could see it happening if it were to be drafted today you guys know my thoughts on Dvorsky he was in the later teens in my draft rankings back in 2023 and I stand by that completely you see what Dvorsky has done against pro top heavy competition physical pressure you look at the Elve as Ven scan I thought he was getting eaten up alive throughout that season he put up some okay totals but a lot of that was on the power play on the man advantage and a five on five I didn't think he was able to generate much you look at the U20 World Juniors where he was pretty neutralized as well and you look at the start of this last year in the SHL he was just it was just awful awful situation for him he didn't get much playing time but in the minutes he did play he wasn't really doing too much and he wasn't really deserving of more ice time he ends up getting loaned to the OHL which I think was the perfect position for him to finally show the goal scoring the power playability and he did 88 points in 52 games you saw what he was able to do offensively
comfortably there. I don't think there's any questioning the shot, the power playability, what he's able to do when space is there. But I have worries over when that space gets tight, when things start to get a lot more physical. That's when Dvorsky hasn't been able to show up. And to me, you look at a player like Quinton Musty, who I think was more effective five on five last year, showing more physical traits and more consistently five on five dominating possession. He was a better point scorer too, showed more consistency. Why isn't Musty getting the nod here? I, I just don't understand it. To me, Musty brings more to the game, more potential, and I like Dvorsky's offensive potential too, but I just feel like him being in the top 10, Dvorsky being the top 10 while Musty's in the sidelines, I just don't like the disrespect here. Either way though, San Jose is going to be benefiting from that. And then we go on to number 10, and here is actually where David Reinbacher ends up. Now, this is where the list gets the most confusing to me because, again, are we talking about teams or are we talking about player rankings here? They mentioned that like Carlson, Reinbacher falling to 10th is less commentary on him and more commentary on what we've seen from other players ahead of him. He's mature, mobile, who reads the ice well, and is good at using his size to reach, to kill plays, and shut down opponents. His style of game he plays suits the blue system well with defense taking priority, but he has a good hockey sense and some playmaking potential. And again, this is where it gets weird to me because if we're talking about teams here, if we're talking about if the redraft actually happened in real life with all these teams going again, I don't think Reinbacher falls to 10. There was a lot of chatter about if it wasn't Montreal, a team like Philly potentially liking him, uh, Arizona slash Utah absolutely adoring him. To me, if Reinbacher were to fall, I don't think he would fall that far. Maybe Montreal goes in a different direction with especially Leo Carlson available, but I just don't think that Reinbacher will fall all that much. Sure, was last year not really too successful in, in Switzerland. It wasn't. It wasn't very good. But I just feel like with what Reinbacher is, with the potential that a lot of GM I'm seeing him with the defensive game and the brilliant skating ability. I think him falling to 10 is almost impossible. Again, you're asking teams like Arizona slash Utah. You're asking teams like Philly, especially who really loved him. You had teams like Nashville as well, reportedly that wanted to trade up to potentially draft Reinbacher if he were to slip. I just don't think that him at 10 is very realistic. I love Zach Benson and I think he's deserving of that spot at 7th overall. But again, being realistic here, I think Reinbacher at 10 doesn't make sense for a team redraft. Now, in terms of the actual player at hand I think this is a much more realistic spot for him than what we actually saw on draft day Reinbacher was in the mid-teens for me he was somebody that I saw the value of the mobility and the skating and the heads-up vision with the playmaking and there is some good great traits to build off of I just didn't really see the offensive potential to draft him fifth overall but I think he can be a solid defensive player and be a big minutes eater which for Montreal they obviously saw as extremely valuable you can see why and as much as people would like to hate on his season in this Swiss League it was a disastrous situation with a horrible team and we saw him play better in the AHL like it was to be expected honestly he was just a, a, a kind of a circumstance of a bad situation there in Switzerland and I think in Reinbacher's case he'll fill out to be a solid NHLD for a long time and again I think at 15 that was around the range I would have put him at maybe I'd have him a little bit higher now but I think 10 is pretty understandable now that's it for the top 10 but it's also pretty notable for the players that end up missing the list you had players within the top 10 like Dmitry Simashev who of course was drafted sixth overall by Arizona you had other players like Nate Danielson as well ninth overall by Detroit interestingly in my own top 10 I had Oliver Moore eighth overall and of course he went to Chicago at 19 but I also had Axel Sandin Palika who was somebody that I was kind of interested to see if he would actually make the list or not he was maybe right outside the cusp is what I would imagine so he was my 10th ranked skater back in 2023 but I think he's somebody that is still around that range for me has proved great things in the SHL offensively and I I still think outside of the top 10 is a pretty great pick and will be a great pick for Detroit. Overall, though, I'm still pretty happy with how I viewed the 2023 draft and how it's progressed since then. It's only been a year, obviously, so there's not that much that could possibly change, but a lot of the players that I did like have had some pretty good seasons since, and I'm really excited to see how they develop. But it's pretty interesting to see how the top 10 has been revised just a year later. I don't agree with a lot of the picks here, but I can understand the reasonings for it, especially players like Meech being at number two, even Dvorsky being inside the top 10. If you're looking at stats i can understand why you'd have them there but it'll be interesting to see how this class develops because we saw some massive surprises and honestly a few of them are working out pretty well one thing is for sure though is that this 2023 draft continues to look fantastic you have so many top end players coming out of it and it's just gonna be so exciting to see these guys be the future of the nhl they already are in cases like bedard but the rest of the group ain't looking too bad either
But I'd love to hear your thoughts down below on what you guys think of this list. What did you agree? What did you disagree? And how would you redraft the 2023 draft if you had the chance now? What would your top 10 look like? I'd love to know your thoughts down below. Of course, make sure you hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, hit that notification bell, and share the video for the hockey fans you guys know online. And of course, make sure you click on this card for all of my hockey prospect talk right in one playlist. My name is Nathan, and I will see you in the next one. Have a great hockey day, and goodbye.